Welcome everyone. My name is Chris Wong and I'm the manager of the US Academy team for Heidelberg Engineering. On behalf of the Heidelberg Engineering Academy, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Simplifying Data Management and Clinical Benefits. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the questions pane and they will be addressed at the conclusion of the presentation or in a follow-up email. Today's presenter, Jonathan Shankel, has been a part of the ophthalmology community since 1997 when he began working as an ophthalmic photographer at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan. He was later named director of the retina lab at Northwestern University before joining Sonamed Escalon to manage the Optivision and Axis product lines. In 2016, Jonathan joined Heidelberg Engineering as the networking and image management solutions advisor for HiX2. Jonathan has co-authored many peer-reviewed journals and has lectured extensively. He is a certified retinal angiographer, optical coherence tomography certified, and has been elected a fellow of the Ophthalmic Photographer Society. Jonathan is also a proud resident of Johns Island, South Carolina. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Schenkel. <laughs> thank you very much, Chris. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Wong. I appreciate the introduction from my distinguished colleague from Virginia. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about HiX2 and some of the uh, clinical benefits of this new platform that we're offering with Heidelberg Engineering. Um, I'm actually going to turn my web camera off because I promise that uh, what I have to show you is far more interesting than, than my mug, but uh, certainly welcome. Um, uh, welcome from Johns Island, South Carolina. I hope everyone is doing well wherever they are, and I guess we'll go ahead and dive right into it. So I will stop sharing that, and I should have control of the screen now, and I do. Okay, great. So, um, and Chris, of course, if, if ever there's a time where you can't hear me or anything like this, just please let me know. But um, I certainly, again, appreciate everyone uh, taking a look tonight. So we're going to be going over a couple things. Um, we're going to talk very, uh, just a little bit about a couple things before we go into a live demo. Uh, we're going to go over what the market looks like for an existing ophthalmic image management pack solution. Um, we're going to talk about new requirements or, or trends that might exist for image management today in the ophthalmic clinical environment. Um, we're going to take a look at what we can do with that data in question. So how can we benefit um, patients with the clinical information that we acquire from the HiX2 application? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about and spend some time on how we can uh, bring a lot of clinical benefits to your HiX2, excuse me, a lot of clinical benefits to your, your, your work environment via HiX2. And then the most exciting part is the live demonstration of HiX2 and the MMV, which um, is short for the multi-modality viewing application. And this is something that we're all very excited about here at Heidelberg Engineering. This uh, became available to us uh, I'd say about a year ago now, um, when HiX2 received full-blown FDA clearance for use as a standalone PAX. Now, HiX2 has always been FDA certified for use on spectralis devices, but with this new certification uh, via the FDA, we are able to look at third-party imaging. So all your other imaging modalities we can look at that within the HiX2 application. We can import those images into the HiX2 database and we can look at them side by side with your spectralis images. So it's a very helpful, a very effective tool, um, something that we're, we're having a lot of fun with. And, and what's really exciting for me is that I get to show you uh, a newer version of the application. So potentially if some of you have HiX2 today, um, this is going to be an upgrade that you're going to be getting. So we're all quite excited again. Um, and then we'll leave some, you know, five or 10 minutes for questions and answers at the end of the session. So please take note of your questions, send them to Chris, uh, submit them, and I would be uh, honored and more than happy to, to, to answer them as best I can. So let's talk a little bit about what the market looks like and, and kind of why we're looking at a packed solution going forward. Um, there's certain drivers of growth that 
will kind of forward the business and certainly forward our um, our reasoning for reaching out and providing these services for image management. In a nutshell, it's pretty straightforward. Folks are getting older, <laughs> and as they get older, uh, folks get sicker, and their vision certainly deteriorates. Um, you know, hand in hand with that, we have a lack of care that's becoming available. So, as folks get older, as they as we see more diabetic conditions happening, as we see more age-related conditions happening, more folks are suffering from glaucoma and cataracts than ever before. In turn, we have less and less ophthalmologists and optometrists who are specialized in treating those vision disorders available. Um, when we add to that the fact that we're getting more and more data, and that's what we mean by data costly imaging methods, um, it, it becomes a real um, a kind of an issue that we have to address, right? Um, and so these new types of imaging, OCTA specifically, are so data rich and so data heavy, it's, it's kind of a blessing and a curse because we're getting all this amazing information, but then at the same time, we have to find a way to easily share that information, to easily look at that information. And we have to find ways to make it um, not only affordable to look at that type of imaging, but also we have to make it make sense in a, in a clinical environment. If we have so much data that's bogging us down in our day-to-day -day operations, it becomes a problem. And so this is really where the PAC solution comes into play. So with all that, we've got some challenges that hopefully we can provide solutions for. Um, and it kind of starts in the center and kind of works its way around um, the most important thing in the daily practice environment is efficiency, and, and not only um, in seeing patients, but how you access and how you look at the information that you have on those patients. So if you're capturing all this information on an individual patient, wouldn't it be nice to have a centralized single platform where you can look at everything and compare everything side by side, and not even not only compare everything side by side, but also take a look at um, the complete imaging history. So uh, certain pathologies and diseases really lend themselves well to uh, historic follow-up, glaucoma certainly in particular, um, but even the macular conditions, you need to have a, a robust historical assessment to determine what's going on today and tomorrow. Um, in addition, when we look at that, having the ability to kind of take all this imaging history and, and apply it, we need to reach the people that need it most. And this is where telemedicine comes into play. Um, so folks that are senior citizens, folks that may not have a lot of mobile access, they can't come into quote the big city to see these specialists. We need to find solutions that will um, allow us to reach out to them directly and to better serve them. Um, so image management is, kind of working in that direction to make that a possibility. And with that, and with the accessibility of all this data that we're receiving, we start to apply it to other things. So not only are we trying to help people in, in remote areas, but we're trying to make them, uh, to give them a, a better uh, quality of life, for one, but also use that sort of uh, information that we gather to help them uh, help them be better in the future. And we can do that by predictive measures, by the AI and the big data research that we're working in. Um, but the backbone of it all is a robust data management system that allows us to kind of take a look at this, this information and to properly do some things with it. So there's a couple different ways that we can get ready for what's coming down the pipe. And um, we, we have to be able to be fairly flexible when it comes to looking at information. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you're gonna have a lot of sources of data and, and informatics coming in, and you need the ability to uh, merge all that information into one a single common platform. Um, it also has to look the same across the board. So you can't be looking at 
um, for instance, macular scans from one provider and comparing them with macular scans from the Heidelberg platform and have them be looking completely different. Uh, certain landmarks need to be consistent across the board, so you have to develop a structure that can recognize that and can properly um, can properly view and display those images in a, in a correct manner. Um, and it has to be fairly simple to be integrated, and we have to take into effect that, take into account that not everyone is going to have robust uh, methods of imaging networks between sites. So we have to accommodate that somehow. Um, and so HiX2 provides a solution for most all of this, right? Um, we can share information between multiple sites. Um, we can really focus on the DICOM imaging standard. Um, you know, our colleagues in Germany are taking the DICOM interfaces and our DICOM conformance very seriously. And it only stands to benefit the user in the long run because this will be very beneficial for archiving and storing of information. If you're ever looking at a VNA, a vendor neutral archive, this is something that will be pretty much a prerequisite, having that DICOM interface, to be, the ability to have a consistent standardized imaging um, a process, a, a consistent imaging methodology with this DICOM interface. This will be crucial. Um, so having that DICOM support is huge. Having the ability to um, really facilitate and to make clinic move a lot faster by this automation of reports that you're used to seeing every day, if it can save you a, a couple seconds when you're creating these, these reports over the course of a day, over the course of a week, it all adds up. Um, and of course, the physician today needs to be able to, to, to look at images that were captured from any of his locations. So if he has seven or eight remote facilities and the patient is seen at one, he needs to be able to follow up with the patient at perhaps the centralized location and compare and contrast all that imaging history across the board. So a robust platform that will deliver all that is definitely, definitely what's uh, needed in the market today. And so how do we get there? How do we, how do we look at this sort of thing? Um, the multimodality viewing is certainly an aspect of it. And I'm, again, I'm very excited to show that to you in a bit. Um, the EMR integration um, that we have today and will be expanding upon, this will be huge as well. In addition, a cloud-based exchange that we are currently developing. These are all things that are coming down the pipeline. Of course, the EMR integration and the MMV, we have that now. But the cloud-based exchange platform, this will be coming down the pipe. And it's something that um, I think will be very beneficial because, you know, it, in very simple terms, provides a safe and secure method of transport between institutions, right? So if you're looking for a, a good way to potentially store information in a cloud environment and, and to actually uh, transmit the information securely and, 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 and with various levels of encryption, this will be the solution. So a couple different ways that we're actually working towards this, um, th this new future of ophthalmology. And of course, as I mentioned, um, there's different ways that we can work towards this telemedicine approach, right? Uh, we, can, we can work on different facilities and different centers that allow us to establish remote viewing networks. And we can tie those in all together via something like HiX2. In turn, that leads to increasing screening programs that are available for the community. So if you have an easy way to take color fundus images, OCTs, visual fields, you can detect and determine these uh, conditions and these diseases well in advance of uh, them becoming a true problem for the majority of these patients. So it would be possible for someone like an optometrist or even a primary care physician to initially recognize these concerns and to send them for more intense uh, structured follow-up with a, a retina specialist, a glaucoma specialist, a, Opto neuro neurology specialist, something like this. Um, so these are all ways that we can have HiX2 uh, working towards this sort of telemedicine solution. I won't go much into this, but just know this is sort of some of the um, healthcare quality uh, benchmark associations that are out there and available to ophthalmologists. Uh, various audits of both uh, patients and conditions 
are, are something that we as a company with Heidelberg Engineering have been doing a lot of work with. Uh, specifically on the AAO side, uh, we're doing a lot of stuff with the IRIS registry, and um, hopefully that will lead to more continued use in the future. In addition, um, we have other forms of, of competition out there, of course, that are doing these existing um, imaging networks and, and basing a lot of predictive information off of the AI sort of um, research capabilities that their products might offer. And we're doing something very similar here at Heidelberg Engineering. Um, it's not quite ready for prime time yet on our end, but having said that, it's something that we're very excited about and we're working with a lot of groups, both uh, domestically and internationally, to deliver um, some really, really fascinating um, uses of our data for predictive medicine. So something to be excited about and to look forward to in the future. So let's spend some time talking about clinical benefits. And I kind of want to keep an eye on the clock because I do have a lot of stuff I want to go over with the actual platform itself. But um, Here's a nice mock-up of uh, how it might look in your clinical environment. Um, hands are included as well because you'll be looking at the images. <laughs> um, but for folks that are familiar with HiX1 exclusively, you can see off the, off the bat that this is a completely different interface. Um, and I should spend a moment kind of talking about how we got here and, and what it actually does in the background without going into too much detail. Um, the HiX1 uh, platform, we'll call it, the one that uh, has been around for a long time with Heidelberg Engineering, um, it has uh, a, a database structure that is um, uh, a little outdated, uh, that's putting it politely, and, and it's, a, it's a Microsoft Access platform. Um, so Heidelberg certainly saw the need to change and enhance this database going forward. Uh, so several years ago, uh, they came in to acquire a German-based radiology PAX, full-blown PAX solution, and have since built that off of, uh, since built HIX2 off of that. Um, so we're very fortunate that we have a very robust application um, that we could build this HIX2 uh, off of. So it handles not only image management, uh, but also acquisition. Um, so everything is built into one. So it, it's quite nice because you have basically all your acquisition capabilities um, immediately available to you, as well as image management and review. So very different, but certainly a lot of things that are rolled into the platform that make it immediately recognizable and, and able to be used. So let's talk a little bit about how we can really streamline the workflow uh, within the HiX2 environment. So let's start with the automated reports. So um, in the past, if you had a certain type of analysis that you like to do with a certain type of OCT scan, you would have to select it. You'd have to um, kind of, I won't say go out of your way, but something that you had to do. You had to physically create this analysis. Um, if every time you take a certain type of volume analysis, every time you take a certain type of uh, optic nerve head analysis or scan, if every time that you do that, you know you want a certain PDF analysis created, um, we can automate that for you via HiX2. So that's huge. Again, it's all about saving time for the clinician. And the, these seconds, I keep, I keep saying it, but these seconds definitely add up. If you can save 30 seconds, a minute per patient, then you're really adding uh, a lot of time to your day at the end, at the end of the day. Um, in addition, I mentioned this before, uh, we do have centralized database support now um, in, in your various locations. So again, if you have uh, remote satellites, you can share a common database between all of your facilities and all your capture stations for your Heidelberg devices. And I should mention for the tech folks out there, the central database that we're looking at, this is a SQL-based application. So uh, we have moved away from that access platform to a true SQL solution. So life's a whole lot nicer for the IT folks. Uh, I know everybody's happy to hear that. We have HL7 integration for automated modality work list functionality. And what that means is that we can take an HL7 feed via your EMR, your practice management, and we can provide a direct feed to the spectralis from the physician's order within the EMR. Um, the benefit of that is that we can provide a, um, a seamless demographic transfer of all the work order information. So there's no 
human error at this point with this HL7 modality workless interface. So gone are the days of a technician or photographer entering in the wrong information or spelling the name wrong or you know typing in the medical record number wrong. Those those are all those are all gone. Uh, this information come over un unadulterated from directly from the EMR itself, and so there's no room for error. In addition, with the navigator, and I'll show you this later on, um, everything it's completely customizable. So if you like your thumbnails bigger, if you like your patient list on one side versus the other, it's all customizable. It's all associated with your individual login. So these are all things that certainly help. Um, as we take another look around, uh, we have the audit and login capabilities. This is all associated with a Active Directory or LDAP support that's offered with HiX2. And, and we'll talk and show you a little bit more about this in a little bit. But with this Active Directory sync or this LDAP support, uh, we can set up kind of a single sign-on application. So you don't have to worry about having separate and unique logins for various EMRs or practice management solutions, all this information can be passed on directly to the Spectralis itself, and as such, you don't have to remember 17 different passwords. In addition, the IT folks have the ability to create audit records, right? And so what that means is that we can tell who's looked at what, who's, um, who's saved what, who's edited, who's done what to an individual patient. Um, if, if we have someone who has uh, saved off images to something that's all traceable right and as a result um, we can we can take a look and know exactly what's been done on any given patient and that goes hand in hand with um, individual login capabilities as well so this is all something that um, provides a more secure environment because um, until this point you didn't really have any sort of individual unique login to HiX applications Anybody could kind of walk up and access the database. So this is very huge. Uh, so talking a little bit about this, uh, the Active Directory components provide the login credentialing information like we talked about. And going forward, these are true DICOM images as opposed to uh, what we might have seen previously. Um, so again, more robust security applications, more SQL platforms, just getting you away from this kind of uh, outdated technology. So let's talk a little bit about how it might look uh, for different types of scenarios within HiX2. So first off, let's just kind of talk about a single, uh, uh, one or two devices in a single scenario. If there's ever a time where you have two Spectralis devices or um, other third-party devices, um, we can certainly share the information back and forth between those said devices, um, but that would facilitate a certain a, a need for a certain type of server. Um, but the good news is, is that all the images can be stored within that server, so you really leave uh, your your capture stations open and available, and they don't have to store terabyte after terabyte of data sitting on these individual stations, or in just attached thumb drive, uh, hard drives. We can handle communication directly to the EHR, the EMR, uh, via the HL7 interface, but also via a DICOM forward. So we can accept DICOM information coming from the EMR, and in turn, we can send it out to the actual viewing applications as well. And again, if you're all on the same network, this doesn't have to be at one location. It can be at multiple locations. Talking a little bit more about this, um, you know, we have the ability to look at multiple different locations, um, all to a common EMR interface, all to a common HiX2 server. So you've got two or three devices, maybe more, at your main facility, and then you have four or five satellite locations ranging from anywhere from one to two devices. This is all feasible via HiX2. Um, HiX1 certainly, as I mentioned, has certain limitations as far as networking capability. Um, you know, we can even take a look at things like support of a virtual server environment. This is currently not supported with the HiX2, HiX1 installation, but with HiX2, not only is it supported, but we certainly encourage it. And this is just a screenshot, basically, of the MMV that I'm talking about, but I'm going to show it to you live here in just a second. 
Um, but you can see we have multiple different imaging modalities here. So we have a blown up image of an optos on this one left hand panel. Um, moving over to the right hand side at the very bottom, we have existing PDFs that were created. Um, going above it, we have an OCTA from a competitor. And going above that, we have a Heidelberg volume scan. And all of these panes that I'm showing you are completely interactive. I can scroll through the scans, I can select individual images, I can, you know, highlight, contrast, annotation, things of this nature. Um, but again, I'll show it to you right now. Uh, I think we're going into this next. Yes, sir. yep, the live demo. So here we go. I'm going to show my screen and certainly hope you guys are coming up with all kinds of great questions that I can get to here in just a moment. So I'm going to minimize this and I hope everybody can see my screen now. If not, you'll let me know. Uh, but we'll start at the beginning here. So this login is exactly what I was talking about. This is where the Active Directory and LDAP components come into play. And so these permission levels and, and, and user authentication rights are set uh, remotely by either your administration or your IT. Um, and as a result, you can determine um, not only, as I mentioned, the auditing capability, uh, so you can see who's done what, but you can also set permissions. So if you have a master user that needs access to everything, um, you can easily have them, um, you can easily set that control remotely. If you have kind of basic users who only need to see things and don't need to edit, that's another level of, of access that you can set and everything in between. So I'll go ahead and log in to my uh, system here. And again, another layer of security that's not currently offered with the HiX1 platform. So you can see here, it takes just a second to open because it's accessing my database here on my laptop. But you can see immediately it's a completely different interface than what we're accustomed to with HiX1. So I have this little message here saying my connection to my server database is restored. And again, I've set up my laptop as a server, but you know, you would have your own unique server. Um, if you kind of look up here, you have a lot of different options as far as finding patients immediately. Um, if I just freehand type in anything that I might remember, uh, of the patient's name or medical record number or date of birth, it'll automatically fill in. Uh, for these purposes, I don't have too many images in my database. So I'm just going to say no restrictions, but you can see I've got many options here. I can say, well, show me all the patients in the last four hours, show me all the, day, all the patients in the last three days or this week, whatever I like. I can even take it further. Uh, when I say show me all the patients in 24 hours for this particular physician at this particular clinic, it can even kind of uh, filter out information on a more granular level. So let's just take a look at no restrictions. It's going to say, are you sure? Yes. And you can see immediately everything pops up. So the idea is really pre pretty straightforward here, folks. We've got the patients listed on the left-hand side. And as I scroll through, um, of course, all these are just sample names, but as I scroll through, um, if I select an individual visit, I can see all the corresponding history on the right-hand side. So if you notice, if I select an individual date, um, I immediately have access to all the thumbnails that were captured during that individual study. So you can see that on this particular patient, I've got images going from 2012 all the way to 2013, which is great. A couple different ways to look at things, and, and I'll kind of uh, go into more in a second here. Um, but before I do that, I kind of want to continue through um, this kind of tab feature here. So again, I, I have an easy way to find images if I want to just to quickly look at things. I did mention that HiX2 is not only image management and image review, but it's also acquisition. So I'm just going to go to this examination tab. Now, of course, I don't have a Spectralis hooked up to my laptop here, um, but this is how it would work. Um, I mentioned the modality work list interface and sending that information directly to the Spectralis. So if I had a patient in front of me, I could literally come over to this start tab and everything I would have in front of me uh, for the day would be listed. So if Mrs. Jones is sitting in front of me, I could select her name from this file or this listing hit start examination, and immediately 
all the demographic information, the, the work orders themselves, they'll all be coming over directly. If I don't have that sort of modality work list interface set up, that's fine. Um, I can just go to new, and this is where I'm asked to enter in information, various demographic information. Once I've done that, I save and start the examination, and it is the exact same um, acquisition protocol that you're accustomed to now with HiX1. So there really is very little um, um, downtime in terms of getting up to speed on this new application, at least as far as acquisition is concerned. Uh, with image review, you have a lot of the same familiar options that you've always had, but you also have some new options as well. And of course, we'll go over all that. Um, so a couple different ways to capture images. Um, if I need to continue an examination, I have that feature. I haven't started one in 24 hours, so the examination is too old. <laughs> I think that's how they describe me sometimes. I'm too old. But uh, if it's it gets if it's past if it's under 24 hours and you've done your examination and you send the, the patient back to the physician, um, you know he or she might call back and say, you know, these are great, Jonathan, but you missed the one point I wanted to see on the fovea. Uh, so you, of course, could start that over again. So again, we'll go into review here in just a second. I want to continue down this little tabbed feature here. Um, you do have the ability to physically, manually, um, and automatically import all types of information into the HiX2 application. The interesting thing is I mentioned everything um, that this is DICOM based and HiX2 as an application and it certainly is. Anything that comes in or out of HiX2 becomes a true DICOM object, not just a, you know, a wrap of sorts. Um, we don't wrap up an image and, and slap a DICOM header on it and call it a DICOM object. It, it's a true DICOM object. And if you've ever spent any time looking at those files and taking them apart, um, first of all, my condolences, because it's the sort of thing that we have to do. <laughs> but um, if, if you've ever spent some time looking at these DICOM files, you know that there's a lot of embedded metadata associated with them. And um, to do it properly does take some work and some commitment. The good news is that my colleagues in Germany have spent a lot of time conforming to the T to these DICOM conformance standards. So I feel very confident in saying that we have one of, if not the most adept DICOM platform in, in, in the world, certainly in the ophthalmic image management world, as far as uh, transmission of data and adherence to the DICOM conformance standard. So having said that, if I import a PDF, if a patient shows up with um, just a bunch of random JPEGs saying, these are my historic images, can you accept them? You can literally import those images, assign them to a certain patient, or assign them to images that you just capture as far as the same patient is concerned. And the same thing is true for any type of written document. If the physician has sent you a hand scanned note, a PDF, a Word document, these can all be entered in. Of course, the same thing is true if they show up out of the blue with the good old HiX1 E2E format. We can import all that information directly into HiX2 as well. Um, so lots of different ways that we can look at images, import images, and of course, a whole nother ball game if we're importing images directly via the MMV, and we'll we'll take a look at that in a second. Just kind of moving on here down down the down the road here. I, I've mentioned that you can literally kind of customize this view into anything you like. If if you want more or less of the default uh, thumbnail views, if you want more demographic information, if you want more of a series outlook where I say, okay, I'm just interested in knowing what was done, the various OCT art volume scans, the B scans, or even if you want uh, just to look at reports instead of the actual images themselves, it's all possible. And the best part is, as I create or, you know, um, adjust these templates, they stay the way that I've done them. So when I log in as my individual user, um, it will look in the same manner as the last way I left it, the way I set it up. So if you really have a preference, you can definitely set these things up to be a very customized view, specific and unique just to you. Before I start getting into how we look at images, we've gone over acquisition, we've gone over importing information in. Let's talk a little bit uh, about how we 
uh, might export images. So if I come over to this side, I've got several different types of uh, tabs available to me. Um, and I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about this very quickly. Um, so we have the ability to, um, of course, export any type of images that we want. It can be as simple as right-clicking on something uh, and then selecting what type of interface I want to do. If I want to do an E2E, a JPEG, if I want to export via XML for uh, other image management solutions or for uh, reading center applications, or if I want to export uh, and you have the ability to, to look at the raw files for, for data research. These are all possibles. This is all, all certainly possible within right-clicking the individual thumbnails. But we also have ways to export them individually, uh, in bulk, uh, and, and multiple patients at a time via DICOM. So let's say I want to see these two sets of images here, and I want to import, export them as a DICOM interface. So I would simply click and drag to the export to drive. You can see it's creating the DICOM file. That's done now. Um, and then once I do that, it's simply a matter of finding the place where I want to send it, right? And so I could say, yep, let's save it to my desktop. Uh, we're going to go to this new folder that I created, um, and I'm going to select those images. You can see that the DICOM files are being created, and you're going to get a message saying that you're all complete and done. So now, if I go back, I have these saved here. And this is the DICOM interface, and this is how it looks when you export DICOM images. If I dive in a little bit, you can see if I go down the list here, that, that all the DICOM files are actually listed out. And I can actually access them and, and use those for any type of export that I want. But um, I know a lot of folks are involved in uh, reading center studies. So we also do have the ability to do that same sort of export function via the E2E. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, if you're involved in these reading center studies, you can still be involved in them. And going forward, nothing will change. You can still export images out in the same way that you're always accustomed to. Um, and of course, if I want to save it onto a CD, burn a DVD, something like this, these are all options too. <clears throat> Excuse me. I also have the ability to play around with the light box. And what that means is that I can actually create files if I simply by, again, clicking and dragging. Um, I can create a folder saying, okay, well, I want to look at uh, these various examinations or have them separated for me um, at any given time here, like so. So now when I come back in, I open up this patient, I've got these three highlighted um, uh, thumbnails and imaging studies that I can look at very, very quickly and very easily. So it's nice. A lot of folks uh, use the Lightbox functionality in Hikes 1. And we certainly move that over to Hikes too. Um, moving down the line, we have other options as far as uh, kind of um, contact association. This is actually a very cool feature. Um, we can create what we call DICOM contacts. And this is just a very simple and easy way to share information between Hikes 2 users. It's kind of like a Dropbox application for Hikes 2 individuals uh, or users of Hikes 2. So simply by creating or entering in very basic information, IP addresses, AE titles, things of this nature, um, we can create what we call a DICOM contact. And then just by clicking and dragging um, individual or multiple images at any given time, we can share information via a DICOM forward securely and safely between those individuals. So the next time they open up Hikes 2, they'll have those images ready for them to review. It's a really cool feature. Um, in addition, we can also create groups within the Hikes 2 application. So if I know that I have a certain case, a certain amount of cases that I'm trying to set aside for grand rounds or a very interesting case or cases that involve um, white dot syndromes, uh, going back to my clinic days, this sort of thing that we, that we did, um, these are all things that I can create unique groups for. Um, so not only can I separate and create unique groups uh, that, that can identify certain pathologies or interesting cases, I can also assign who gets to see those. So I can create the users within those groups themselves. Um, so a good way to share information amongst a certain amount group of people 
Uh, if you want only a retina specialist to see certain images, then you can create groups that accommodate that. Um, so now, certainly last but not least, um, let's take a look at how we actually look at images. And um, this is the most exciting thing for me. So starting with a very rudimentary um, double click sort of thing, uh, I have the ability to, you guessed it, double click on a thumbnail and a very familiar view pops up. Now this is a very familiar interface to folks that are using HiX1. Um, all the sort of applications and functionalities that you're accustomed to today, this is embedded within HiX2. So acquisition and immediate review, it's all very consistent to what you know. So you can get up and running very quickly. All the same functionality is there. If I wanna compare any two frames or any two studies at any given time, I have, the, of course, the ability to do that. Um, if I wanna look at a 3D view, um, we'll let this, Think about it for a second. There we go. This is always uh, available to you and, 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 and quite uh, impressive. And of course, the thickness map. Now again, um, as I mentioned earlier, you have the means to automatically create this just by acquiring images. So uh, certainly a good HiX2 feature going forward. So that's all very cool. And it's nice that, of course, I have, again, access to the, the documentation. But if you remember, when I was in my volume scan and I wanted to kind of look at um, two images just kind of side by side, that's what I was limited to, was two individual studies. Of course, I can change the dates by going through and whatnot, and that's fine. But let's say I wanted to look at more, if I do have certainly more visits available. With HiX2 and the multi-modality viewing application, it is certainly possible. So let's take a quick look at that. So I'm just going to click and drag over to the layout tabs and pick a uh, corresponding view that I might like. So this is a very good one to look at um, individual line scans and volume scan analysis. So as you can see, I've got the one that I selected right here. Now, what happens when I right click and hit control? I have immediate access to thumbnails of everything else that I've ever had done right? So I can say, well, this is fantastic. So I've got the visit from 2012. I want to take a look at a corresponding one from, mm, let's say, 2013. So I literally will scroll down. I'll pick the one that I want. Let's say this one might do. Um, yep, there we go. And now I want to do the same thing for a visit, a different visit in 2013. So again, let's just come right down here. Uh, pick the one I want again. And so you can see now that I've got three separate visits. And what I want to do is kind of make sure they're all the same, same location, if you will. So now, when I come here and I select all three of them, as I have right here, I can move them at the same exact rate and speed, right? Everybody see that? So you can see truly the progression with this full thickness macular hole over time. Um, so we have 2012, 2013, and another one in 2013. The exact same scans, location, thanks to our eye tracking capability. Um, so that's great, that's very nice. But what happens if I wanted to see that potentially with a different type of device? Um, makes sense, right? So, you know, we have a lot of people who potentially have studies done on a uh, Zeiss or a Canon or a Topcon, an OCT, if you will. Um, and you might want to look at things side by side with your spectralis images. Certainly understandable. The multimodality viewing application allows for that. So let's just take a quick look here and see how we would best look at that. So what I'm going to do is to select my volume scan uh, for my spectralis, right? So here we are. And now I'm going to right click again and see the exact imaging history that I have available for me. I'll scroll down and take a look and these are some Zeiss images. So again, if I click and drag this right here, I now have the ability to take a look and to perfectly synchronize the same patients just like so. So two different modalities, two different imaging types, same patients, 
um, looking at things side by side. So that's a Heidelberg and a Zeiss. Let's say I wanted to see, you know, I've done Optos images, I've done um, an OCTA, I've done Zeiss images, um, all on myself it looks like, <laughs> and Heidelberg spectralis images, um, a, a color fundus photo, and an OCTA from another manufacturer. I'd like to really be able to take a look at all those. It's certainly possible with, within the HiX2 application. So again, let's just come right over here. I'm going to select a different format now because I need more and different options. So starting with this Optos image, you can see I can scroll through the whole study just like I'm sitting at the machine. Um, I have enhancement tools available. I have magnification tools available. Um, and once I set my magnification, I can scroll through just like I'm sitting there. So that's great. That shows me a nice image of, of, of the left eye. And what I want to do now is see what else I have available to take a look at side by side. So I'll come over here. Okay, I want to see the OCT. Um, I want to see the OCTA of this one individual patient. And I also want to see a different type of color fundus photo. Okay, great. So again, four different imaging modalities all being viewed at the same place. So this is pretty exciting for me. Um, because we haven't had this sort of functionality available with Heidelberg Engineering in the past. So again, as I mentioned before, all these are interactive, and I can scroll through just like I'm sitting at the machine on each and every one of them if they have that capability. This is a static image, so it's not going to have that. But I can also put up reports. I can do all sorts of things. I have various measurement tools available. I can save various things off as JPEGs or TIFFs or movie files just a really good way to look at images side by side. And again, it really doesn't matter what type of imaging device you have. So I can do things like, I want to look at these Zeiss 450 images, these, these static color photos and this fluorescein angiogram. So I'm just going to pick four random images in the, in the study and then say, I'd like to look at all four of those together, just like that. Of course, if I pick more, I'll see more. But here we have the individual frames that I selected. If I want to see any one of them large, I just simply select it, just like that. If I want to kind of select all of them and get rid of these lines, I can do that as well. Um, there's really no limit to what I can do with these images. And of course, if I want to look at them potentially in a different layout, I just simply select it from the dropdown, just like so. And I can save these individual frames. I can save this four up. Whatever I'd like to do, I can send that to the EMR. It's certainly all possible. So one thing I wanted to show you with the multimodality viewing application, when I do do that right click, I've got a couple different options. I can make it so it's just kind of listed on this side, on the left-hand side, scroll through here. I can change the thumbnail size if I want to make it more easily manageable. But the really cool thing, if I come over here to something that has multiple exam or multiple images, if I select that drop down, it shows me all the individual scans that I have there. So I can select any of those from the study itself, the progression study. So I thought that was pretty cool. I definitely wanted to show that to you. But let's take a look at a couple other devices, some common devices. Let's take a look at, I mean, we looked at the Zeiss. We looked at um, what does an IOL master look like? We can do things like this. I've got the printouts. I've got the, um, the kind of infrared image here for the iris itself. And if I come over here, a very easy way to look at it is just select those images and pull them right over. And now I have access to all the imaging data that I selected embedded with the iris image as well. So very quick, very easy ways to look at things. Um, of course, we're not limited to uh, the way that uh, we look at just the uh, Heidelberg device. We can look at, for instance, we've, we've looked at Zeiss images. Here's some TopCon files. And again, I'm scrolling through just like I'm sitting at the machine. Embedded uh, is the color fundus image that was captured with this TopCon OCT. But these are all things that I can look at side by side with the with the Heidelberg images. You know, we've got maybe about eight or ten minutes now left in the presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and close out the MMV and the HiX2 application. I will stop showing my screen, turn on my webcam so you can see me, and hopefully I can answer some questions for everybody.
Thank you very much, Jonathan, for that great presentation. And at this time, Jonathan will take some questions, as he said. Uh, if you have a question, please enter it into the questions pane. And we have quite a few questions for you, Jonathan. <laughs> great, um, perfect. <laughs> which is fantastic. Um, the first question we have for you is, um, are there any limitations with the MMV? And I think the, the questioner was getting at um, as far as devices um, and yeah. types of images. Well, I can tell you that in general, uh, our preference for importing MMV information is via that DICOM interface. So what that means is that it, in a nutshell, pretty much any contemporary device that has a DICOM interface, the answer is no, there's no limitation. We can accept that information. So that's a good thing. We have also, we also realize that not every device has a DICOM capability, especially older devices, right? And so we have developed forms of transmission of demographic and imaging data to support that interface into HiX2 as well. So older devices we can support via a different interface. More contemporary current devices via DICOM, that of course is our preference, but the answer is ultimately we have pretty much a solution for what you have. Now, that's assuming it's an imaging device and it's an imaging output. So I say that because things like lensometers and autorefractors that just have numerical outputs, sometimes that's difficult to import. I'm not saying it's impossible, uh, but it's a case-by-case -case situation. So hopefully that answered your question. Um, is the database archived in a similar way as in the old software? Uh, it's completely different in the way that the database is structured. You know, we've moved away from this flat file scenario with Microsoft Access to a SQL-based platform. With that comes more flexibility, um, including automated archiving and archiving to NAS solutions. So uh, other types of storage not immediately embedded within the server environment. So um, different pretty much in every way, and certainly I think a lot easier for you as an individual user. Great. Um, so I have a couple of questions that kind of link together here. Um, so when you're importing in HiX files, so the, the E2E files, um, are you yep. losing anything from going HiX1 importing into HiX2? You are not. Uh, in fact, you're gaining everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> So the E2E is very robust in the fact that it holds a lot of information, but man, I'm telling you, the DICOM files and the DICOM headers st store so much information. So really, um, you're, you're gaining access to information and metadata that was really embedded deep in that E2E file. Um, the good thing about HiX2 is that when we set up HiX2 at your institution, the data migration is part of the process, right? Um, so changing over the E2Es to the DICOM format, that's all part of your HiX2 installation. We never affect the initial primary source of data. We make a copy of it, and then we migrate and change that information over. You potentially have your existing historic E2E at all times. Once we change it over, you won't need it anymore, but it's completely different at that point. So no, you don't lose any information. You only uh, gain functionality. Great. Is, is there a limit to the database size in HiX2? As big as you want to build that server, there is no limit. No, sir. Uh, I mean, but we have facilities, for instance, we have clients that have easily over 50 terabytes of data stored in their HiX2 application, a single server. So really, the sky's the limit. We can build it out to any size. Storage is relatively inexpensive, so um, take all the pictures you want. Great. All right, so we have time for one more question, Jonathan. Um, can images from a third-party device be saved directly into HiX2? Yep, that's how it works. Um, of course, each device is different, but for instance, we have it set up on most contemporary devices where um, you basically finish the examination or save the examination within that third-party device, and it goes over automatically into HiX2. So there's no, you know, putting it into a folder or creating a folder, or putting it into a file or something like this. It happens automatically for you. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. That was a fantastic presentation. And thanks to everybody in the audience for attending. 
We hope you found today's webinar educational and thought-provoking. Um, if you'd like to learn more about future webinars or events, please like us on Instagram or Facebook. Also, be sure to sign up for the Business Lounge at www.heidelbergengineering.com. By, by re registering on the, uh, for the Business Lounge, you'll get notifications um, and information about upcoming webinars. Um, you'll also get access to free educational information and guides, videos, and e-learning modules. Uh, thank you again, and we'll see you on our next webinar. Thanks, everybody. My information's there if you want to reach out to me directly, and I appreciate you listening.